whenever humanity creates a technology as powerful and potentially useful as AI, we owe it to ourselves and our future generation to make it right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who've made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. And today we're continuing our conversation about AI, this time with Stanford professor and researcher Fei Fei Li. Now, if you didn't catch the last episode, be sure to check it out because Kevin has a conversation about AI with another Stanford academic and researcher, Surya Ganguly. And you guys went deep. Yeah, it's sometimes very hard to uh contain myself we we uh we got super technical uh just because it was super fascinating uh what what we were chatting about yeah, and so one of the things that we talked about last time, Kevin, was the need for inspiring and positive stories about AI. And uh, I think that you and I, I think we made a promise to uh, write a screenplay. Yeah, in our copious free time, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have so much of it. Uh, but, you know, I have been thinking about the screenplay. And so recently I was reading an article about AI and animals and how they think that they're only about a decade out from having a kind of language translator. So you mean like the dogs from the Pixar film Up, Squirrel? Yes, yes, yes. The the, the small mailman smells like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the research might have applications in animal welfare where, for instance, they might be able to use AI to track the faces of sheep or cows in order to detect pain um, and illness and then provide faster medical treatment. So they've also done some really incredible studies with prairie dogs who they believe have a very complex language system. And so that would be really tempting, in my opinion, to kind of write a show with the typical trope of uh, the talking family pet, you know, like like Mr. Ed. But, you know, <laughs> grumpy cat, may she rest in peace. You know, maybe she wasn't grumpy at all. Maybe she was, like, happy-go-lucky. Uh, <laughs> but, but kind of back to the prairie dogs, you know, I do think that, that there, that's one that hasn't been done yet. You know, we could maybe do, like, a, a Little House on the Prairie uh, remake, but with AI. Yeah, you know, I we're we're uh, trying to make a stab at comedy here, but uh, f- funny enough, when Fei Fei and I were chatting before the podcast, she was telling me about this Chinese company that does face recognition for cows. Huh. Uh, so, like, you you may not be that far off, but <laughs> despite that, uh, like, may- maybe we should stick to our day jobs. Maybe I guess. Okay, <laughs> all right. So we should definitely meet Fei Fei Li. Yeah, let's do it. Next up, we'll meet with Fei-Fei Li. Fei-Fei is considered one of the pioneering researchers in the field of artificial intelligence. She's a computer science professor at Stanford University and the co-director of the Human-Centered AI Institute there. Fei-Fei served as the director of Stanford's AI lab, and during a recent sabbatical, she was a VP at Google, serving as chief scientist of AI and machine learning at Google Cloud. So thank you so much, Fei-Fei, for coming in today. I've been uh, wanting to chat with you for a really long time now. Um, Likewise, Kevin. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So I usually start these things by trying to understand a little bit of the story of the folks that we're chatting with. And I'd be really interested to understand, like, how you started to really get seriously interested in computer science. So... I came to computer science through a pretty convoluted detour. So I was always kind of a STEM kid, so mm-hmm. to say. So I was interested in the in the nature, in the stars, the you know, animals and all that. But my first passion, first love was physics. Awesome. So starting in junior high and then high school, I was just passionate about physics, studying relativity, you know, reading. And, and about, what was it about? Was it that you, like, it gave you a lens to understand the world? Was it that yeah. you just liked the mathematics of it? What, what was the thing? I think it's the, the combination of the imagination and the mathematical rigor, but it's really about peeling off question after question to go after the very original questions, right? right? Like, 
Where do I come from? Where do humans come from? What's human made of? Where do atoms come from? Where do you know where yeah. the first atoms come from? You just very so you go to Big Bad. So basically, so, you're infinitely curious. Yeah, so <laughs> I was. So physics was my love, and I majored in physics at Princeton when I went to college. Awesome. And you know, Princeton is the mecca for physics, and first day in the. Freshman year physics class, the professor said, "This is the very lecture hall that Einstein was sitting in." <laughs> it was just like a dream, right? So, but the 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 around the sophomore junior year in college, I started reading books about these great great physicists of twentieth century, like Schrödinger and Einstein. And as I read. I noticed that towards the later half of their life, their interest turned from the physical atomic world to the more life science world.、Mm -hmm. They are starting to ask questions of origin of life, intelligence, and that really piqued my interest. I started to get very interested in the question of intelligence, so I joined neuroscience research. And I was literally, as a summer intern research student, literally recording from、um, mammalian brain and listening to the neurons, seeing the world.、Oh, so fun. Yeah. So I decided to apply for grad school, and even there, I chose to go to Caltech because I was able to find two advisors. One in neuroscience, one in now we call AI, but at that time we call、uh, computer vision. Right. To do my PhD study in in that combination. And why vision? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so, well, like I said, my first experiment in neuroscience was recording from cats' neurons and. Watching their neuronal activity when cats see the world, you know, see oriented edges, see complex、uh, features. But really, if you think about vision, I want to tell you a story. Five hundred forty million years ago, the world is very different. It、mm -hmm. was mostly water and simple animals floating on Earth, and there were only a few species. And、uh, life was chill. You know,、mm -hmm. you just hang out by floating. <laughs> And then, what zoologists have found, or evolutionary biologists have found, is this incredibly mysterious phenomena called Cambrian explosion. Within a short ten million year span, in the history of Earth, or in the evolution sense, it's such a narrow slice of time. The animal kingdom just exploded. Many, many animal species. Got created or, or evolved, and people call this the Big Bang of evolution, and、mm -hmm. no one understood why. So why, from 540 million years to 530 million years ago, this Big Bang of evolution happened? So fast forward a decade ago, a young evolutionary biologist called Andrew Parker from Australia studied a lot of fossils. And conjectured, and, and it became a very convincing theory that it was the onset of vision. It was、really? the first animal, some kind of floating trilobite, developed a pinhole, a structure. It's very simple. It literally just collected some light.、Mm -hmm. Once you see light, life changes. You become active. You see your food,、mm -hmm. and you can hide and. Escape to become someone else's food,、hmm. so it becomes an evolutionary arms race for animal species, and with that kind of active lifestyle, so to say, because of vision, animals started to evolve much faster.、And、Interesting. Fast forward five hundred forty million years later, visual intelligence is the most fascinating to me, and. Complex sensory system of human brain. Half of our brain are involved in visual processing and understanding, and that's a lot. And it's super interesting because I think a lot of people, you know, if you're trying to just sort of reflect on your, 
you know, your own intelligence. Like a lot of that is about language. Like in, in fact, even the, you know, sort of the meta process of thinking about your intelligence is linguistic. Like mm-hmm. you're sort of having this dialogue with yourself mm-hmm. and with everyone. But your suggestion is that like vision is like the more, you know, sort of fundamental thing maybe. So I'm not saying that language is not important and it's a unique part of human intelligence. Mm-hmm. But I recommend you read a book by Alison Gopnik called mm-hmm. Scientists in a Crib. Mm-hmm. And she's a developmental psychologist and a philosopher who studies babies, very young babies. Mm -hmm. So when you say language, I just want to challenge you, are babies intelligent Mm -hmm. before they develop language, right? In fact, they're the most fascinating creatures uh, we create because in the our first two years of life, which language is not the primary tool, they are just curious creatures exploring, understanding, and interacting with the world. They develop the theory of the other mind. They develop the sense of objects. They they develop social intelligence. They do face recognition. They navigate. They manipulate. They crawl. They, they understand space. And this is all without language. Mm-hmm. So I just want to highlight how incredibly deep, important, and useful visual intelligence is. And of course, as soon as language gets developed, you can see the interaction between vision and language. One of the most exciting areas of research that I'm doing right now is the interplay between vision and language. But oh. vision is, for me, is just highly fascinating. So tell us a little bit about your PhD work. So like you're in this program, you've got a, a neuroscience advisor and a, like a basically a computer vision advisor. And so like what does your dissertation research look like? Yeah. <laughs> so that was a great question. So I literally did a combination of cognitive neuroscience and uh, computer vision. So on the cognitive neuroscience part, I started my PhD in the first year of 21st century, 2000. Mm-hmm. And Little did the public know that even today's AI revolution owes a lot to the incredible advances in cognitive science starting from 70s, 80s and going well into the 90s because we're mapping out some of the incredible capabilities of human intelligence system, including vision. And one of the most fascinating area of vision at that time I was studying is our ability to understand natural world. We, uh, an earlier study by an English scientist living in France, Simon Thorpe, shows within 150 milliseconds of seeing a complex visual scene, humans are already capable of understanding if the scene contains an animal without or it doesn't. And here we're talking about all kind of potential animals in all kind of environment. Right. So that processing was fascinating. So one of my study in PhD time was actually to quantify how much we see at the moment we open our eye mm-hmm. from objects to people to movements. And how do you do that experiment? Oh, that's fun. So (laughs) in cognitive neuroscience, it's called psychophysics. So what I would do at that time is collect hundreds of photos from Flickr, actually. Mm -hmm. And these photos are all daily user uploaded photos. So it goes from like birthday parties to, you know, surfing in in the ocean to all kind of topics. And then we put a program where you code up a program and then you put a human subject in front of a computer screen and then you flash the photo quickly and Mm -hmm. you control the amount of time you flash the photo. We literally went down to 27 milliseconds Mm -hmm. all the way to 500 milliseconds to show the photo to the human. Mm -hmm. And then we control how long the picture gets seen. Right. And then we ask the people to write down what they see. Interesting. And we pay $10 for the undergrads who participate (laughs) in the experiment. And then we collect a lot of data. Of course, there's a scientific rigor had to kick in. Right. And then we statistically analyzed this and understood. It was one of the first studies that ever quantified how much people see within literally a glance of a scene. That's really interesting. So, like, in 150 milliseconds, like, your brain can see this image and decode enough of it where you can sort yeah, of explain back what's, what's exactly. in it. Exactly. Test it yourself. Just open your eye and close it. And that will be longer than 150 milliseconds. But within that very short amount of time, 
the comprehension you have of the visual world is so rich. And that inspired my AI work because at that time, most of computer vision was still, you know, recognizing letters. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, I remember. Right, and or and they were non-neural network models. Right.、Uh, well, neural network was invented. In fact, my first course at Caltech was called neural network,、mm-hmm. but it was working on very simple stimuli like digits and numbers. And then computer vision was still trying to understand edges.、Mm-hmm. And then my advisor Pietro Perona was one of the pioneering scientists in computer vision who said. Why don't we venture into real-world object recognition?、Mm-hmm. And with my study on the neuroscience side, we also have evidence that this is what humans are capable of and, and are good at. And we really have to move computer vision towards、mm-hmm. that human capability. Yeah. So I studied my AI research in enabling computers. To see and understand everyday objects. But that's a that's a big leap. I mean, we sort of take for granted that image classifiers are reasonably good now. But、yeah. like when you're doing this back in 2000, to like have the idea that I want to go from this like relatively sort of simplistic, and not to like denigrate in any way all the computer vision research because like some of the best people I、uh, I know like the smartest people I know were doing that work. But it's a big leap from that to、yeah. like I want to do like. Whole object recognition inside of images. It was a leap. I mean, I didn't single-handedly do it. Like I said, there were a few incredibly forward-thinking scientists: Jitendra Malik, David Lowe, Pietro Perona. They're starting to think in that way. But we've, as a field, made mistakes and and had detours. Right at that time, we were. Thinking about how to mathematically construct those、uh, handmade models to describe objects, and that took years and years to do, and it didn't deliver the results we want. Yep. And one of the projects, it's really ironic but also fun to reflect back, is that data was so scarce、mm-hmm. at that time that my very first object. Recognition project is called One Shot Learning. Is to work on a setting that we only have one or two picture to train the、right. algorithm on. And today, you think about the big data <laughs> age, and what I did for ImageNet, it was almost the polar opposite. Right. <laughs> But it's a capability humans have. Yeah. And we try to replicate that. Yeah, and I want to come back to that in a minute. But like you brought up ImageNet, so like this is one of the things you're most well known for, and you know, as I listen to you talking about your PhD work, it sort of seems like a natural extension、uh, to an extent of what you're、uh, what you're doing. So like for the audience, like why don't you describe what ImageNet is? Okay, so ImageNet was a project we started in 2007 and more or less completed in 2009. The end result is at that time the largest、uh, database of natural object images in the world. It consisted of 15 million images organized in everyday English language. Of twenty-two thousand vocabularies,、mm-hmm. mostly nouns, and we collected this dataset for about three years by labeling, cleaning, sorting almost a billion internet pictures. And what ImageNet did is it provided one of the most critical ingredient as data for enabling neural network architecture to train. And that was the onset of the deep learning revolution. Yeah, I mean, like you sort of are being a little bit understated about it, but like it's almost impossible to imagine like how that rapid iteration loop with exploration of these DNN architectures and like the techniques that we develop to train them quickly on GPUs and whatnot, like none of that really could have happened without this big database of training data. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you for saying that. And we we designed and developed the image image that because we believed strongly in around two thousand six two thousand seven that we have to hit the reset button for machine learning. 
the the work we have been doing the past few years exploring different models didn't quite work for the scale and the scope of our real natural visual world of so many different objects and the varieties they represent. So my students and I conjectured that the way to really think about modeling objects through machine learning techniques is to think through data. And that was a pretty bold statement at that time because at that time people were constructing uh, small probabilistic models through hand design and a lightweight training of parameters. Yep. So for us to go in to say that, hold on, let's just rethink about this whole thing through a data point of view was kind of, uh, you know, um, a minority way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it, it, you know, again, like just sort of absolutely necessary. And like curious what you think about, we're sort of in this state right now where we're beginning to see people do really interesting things with uh, reinforcement learning and mm -hmm. unsupervised learning where mm -hmm. you're getting a little bit away from requiring so much explicitly labeled data. So like the data is still very important, but like you don't have to go through this exercise of annotating like, oh, there's a cat in this image, yeah. there's a red ball in this right. image. And like the results actually are the interesting ones that have uh, come out over the past couple of years have mostly been natural language uh, things with these big unsupervised models. Like, do you think that's sort of a trend that will continue across a bunch of different domains? Absolutely. I think this is very exciting. I think, uh, you know, if you reflect on human intelligence, our way of learning is very multidimensional, right? Mm -hmm. We do have training and supervision-based learning, especially when you teach a kid manner. Yeah. It seems lots of supervision is needed. <laughs> <laughs> but children and grown-ups learn from trial and error, learn mm -hmm. from few shots, learn in unsupervised setting, learn with rewards yep. and punishments sometimes. Yep. So that kind of flexibility is clearly critical and evolution has built into human intelligence and for machine intelligence to become more robust to serve human world better in different settings. I think that kind of unsupervised learning or fuchsia learning or reinforcement learning is absolutely needed. I'll give you an example that uh, I work with healthcare industry mm -hmm. a lot because uh, part of my research these days deals with AI and healthcare. And one of the settings that we work with is senior well-being and senior safety. And fall detection is a huge thing for seniors. In, in fact, falling account for billions and billions of dollars of medical spending for American seniors. And, you know, it can be fatal. And even if not fatal, can cause a lot of uh, pain and issues for yeah. our aging population. Well, when it comes to falling, it's a rare event. We immediately run into a lack of data problem right. when we are working with the doctors, right? It's very, very hard to collect an image net of seniors right. falling, and you don't want to. Right. So, and, and, like, the seniors don't have cameras in their homes. Right. And, yeah. and they fall in such different ways, and the situation is complex. Yep. So when you want to work in these critical issues, you're immediately in this so-called few-shot Mm -hmm. learning situation. And you probably have to consider transfer learning, consider, you know, simulated learning and yep. all that. So it just shows that the field now, I'm very glad to see, is moving beyond just large data supervised uh, right. learning. You mentioned healthcare, which is, I think, like one of the most promising focus areas for AI right now. And, you know, I know that you're one of the co-directors of the Stanford Human-Centered AI Institute. And, like, and you're I've, one uh, of our advisors. <laughs> um, so how are you thinking about what we need to do to get AI to better serve the interests of everyone? Well, Kevin, that's a big topic. Yep. And I think that's a really important topic, right? Whenever humanity creates a technology as powerful and potentially useful as AI, we owe it to ourselves and our future generation to make it right. So first of all, I think the institute that both of us are involved in is really laying out a framework of thinking about this. And the framework is human-centered, mm -hmm. is that 
from the get-go, from the design and the basic science development of this technology, all the way to the application and impact of this technology, we want to make it human benevolent. Mm -hmm. And with this framework in mind, we have at Stanford, this institute works on three principal founding principles to cover different aspects of human-centered AI. The first principle is actually what we've been talking about is to continue to develop AI technology, basic science technology that is humans-inspired, betting on the combination of cognitive science, psychology, yep. behavior science, neuroscience to push AI forward so that the technology we, we will be using have better coherency or better capability to serve human society. Right. So that's the first principle. Second principle is I would love to hear your thoughts. You know, you and I are trained as a generation of technologists that the technology is solidly considered a um, engineering field yep. or computer science field. But I think AI really has turned a chapter. AI is no longer a computer science field. Correct. AI is so interdisciplinary today. In fact, some of the most interesting fields that AI should really contribute and also welcome to join force are social sciences and humanities. Yep. And at Stanford, we're already seeing the collaboration between AI researchers with economists, yep. with ethicists, philosophers, education experts, legal scholars, and all that. To do this, our goal is to understand what this technology is really about, understand its impact, but also forecast anticipate the perils, anticipate the pitfalls, anticipate unintended consequences, and really with the eventual goal of guide it and recommend policies that are good for all of us. So that's the second principle, really understand, anticipate, and guide AI's human and societal impact. Yeah. The third and the last but not the least principle is something I know you and I feel passionate about, is really to emphasize the word enhance instead of replace. Because AI technology is talked about as a technology to replace humans. I think we should stay vigilant about job displacement and labor market, but the real potential is using this technology to enhance and augment human capability, to improve productivity, to increase safety, and to really eventually to improve well-being right. of humans. And that's what this technology is about. And here we're talking about healthcare. Another vertical that we put a lot of passion and resource in is education, sustainability, yes. manufacturing, and automation. These are really humanly and societally important areas yeah. of development. Well, just sort of sticking with healthcare and like your elder care example, like this is something that I don't think a whole lot of people spend time thinking about unless they're taking care of an elderly uh, yeah. parent yeah. or relative. Like we're not thinking about like how systemically we can make the lives of elderly people better. And like we're certainly not thinking about the big demographic shifts that are oh about to come. Oh, my God. It's going to come globally. Yeah, globally. I mean, so – I mean, you and I have chatted about this before, but, you know, we sort of see in almost all of the industrialized economies, but also in Japan, Korea, and China, yeah, you absolutely. have this very large bubble of working age population that's getting older and older, and we just don't have high enough fertility rates in <laughs> these younger generations to replace it. So at some point, like we... Across the entire world, we're going to have far more old people than we will have working age people. And you have like a couple of big questions when that happens, like who takes care of all the old people and like who's going to do all the work? And it's actually not far enough away that we can not think about it. Is, yes. I think the la the, the, we have to find the actual number, but the last baby boomers become the, mm -hmm. the aging population, the yeah. youngest. So we were very close to that. Yeah. And also, to do this research in aging population, I spent a lot of time in senior homes and senior centers. Uh, one thing I learned as a technologist is that 
we should really develop the kind of empathy and understanding yes. of what we really are working on and working for. For example, I cannot tell you how many Silicon Valley startups are there to create robots as senior companions. And when some of them feel <laughs> robots can replace family, nurses, yeah. friends, I really worry. Yeah. And I really want to encourage these entrepreneurs to spend a lot of time with the seniors. Yeah. One thing I learned a lot about well-being with aging population is dignity, social connection is the biggest part of aging. And so my dream technology is something that you don't notice, but it's quietly Correct. there to help, to assist, to connect people, to ensure safety, rather than this big robot, you yeah. know, sitting in the little middle of the living room and replacing the human connectivity. Yeah, it's really funny that you're bringing all of this up. I'm writing a book right now on why I think people should be hopeful about the potential of AI, like particularly in uh, rural and middle America. And for the book, I went back to where I grew up in rural central Virginia in like this, you know, very small town. And I visited the nursing home where three of my grandparents spent the last chunk of their life. And I was just chatting with some of the people there. And uh, I asked the nurses and the managers in this place, like, you know, what, what, what do you think AI... And like when when I say AI, like the you vision tech, that conjures yeah. is like, oh, there's going to be some human equivalent Android coming in, and right. they'd be like, no, the, the the residents would be terrified by this thing. Whereas like they've got a bunch of thing like dispensing medicine, for exactly. instance, uh, like yep. you know when, when you're elderly, like you're taking this like complicated cocktail of medicines and like getting it dispensed in the right amounts at the right time through the day, making sure that you actually take the medicine. Mm -hmm. Like that's a problem that we could solve with AI-like technologies, mm -hmm. like, you know, combination of robotics and computer mm -hmm. vision. But it wouldn't be like this talking, walking, you know, robot. It would be like a set of things that sort of yeah. disappear into the background and just sort of become part of the operation of the place. Absolutely. And like that, I think we should have more ambition for that sort of thing Absolutely. rather than this, you know. We, that's why uh, Stanford HAI wants to encourage that. The best technology is you don't notice the technology, yes. but your life is better. Yes. That's the best technology. I could not agree more. And also, just talking about the rural America, this is something I feel passionate about, and I have a story to share with you. So you probably know that I co-founded and chair this uh, nonprofit education organization yeah. called AI for All, right? Yep. It started as a summer camp at Stanford about five years ago to encourage diversity students to get involved in AI, especially through human-centered AI studying and research experience to encourage them to stay in the field. And then our goal is in 10 years, we would change the workforce composition. Yep. Now it became a national nonprofit and uh, seed granted by uh, Melinda Gates and Jensen Huang Foundation. And, uh, that's awesome. Now, I didn't know Jensen was involved. That's great. Yeah, it's a Jensen and Lori Huang Foundation. And this year, we're on 11 campuses nationwide. Uh, one of the populations we put a lot of focus on, in addition to gender, race, income, is geographic diversity mm -hmm. and serving rural community. For example, our CMU campus is serving rural community in Pennsylvania. We also have Arizona campus. One story actually came out of our Stanford camp is Stephanie. Stephanie is still a high school junior now, and she grew up in the backdrop of strawberry field mm -hmm. in rural California. Yep in a trailer park with a Mexican mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she come from that extremely rural community, but she's such a talented student and has this knack and interest for computer science. And she came to our AI for All program at Stanford two years ago. And after learning some basics about AI, one thing she really was inspired is she realized this technology is not a cold-blooded just a bunch of codes, it really can help people. Yep. So she went back to her rural community and started thinking about what she can do using AI to help. And one of the things she came up with is water quality. Yes. 
really matters to her community. And so she started to use machine learning techniques to look at water quality through water samples. Mm -hmm. And that's just such a beautiful example. I just yeah. love her story to show that when we democratize this technology to the communities, the diverse community, yeah. especially these communities that technology hasn't reached enough in, the young people, the leaders, and, and the citizens of this community will come up with such innovative and relevant yep. ideas and solutions yeah. to help those communities. And I, I think that getting this technology democratized is sort of a one-two punch. So, like, there's the technical things that you have to do, so and open source and, like, making sure that the research is open and freely available and being able to run these things on cloud platforms, you know, and in it. Like, all of that's super important. It's actually amazing. Like cloud how, and edge. Yes, uh, cloud and edge for sure. And it's really amazing, like, how much is possible now. Mm -hmm. Like, I know you probably have this all the time. It's like you're sitting in 2019 and seeing what your students can do, and yeah. you sort of compare that to what you could do in yeah. 2000. It's like, Ugh. you know, and, you know, that's because you have bright students, but it's also because, like, the tools that they're using are, like, incredibly sophisticated now. But that's only half of the story. Like, the other half, and, like, I'm so glad that you're doing this nonprofit work because if we really want – the benefits of this technology to be, you know, sort of equitably and widely distributed, you have to have people who have a connection to the communities and the human beings that the technology Absolutely. needs to serve. Absolutely. B because, it's, and it's not that anybody's bad. It's just like if you don't have that context and that empathy, like you just don't really know what to do or, or maybe even how to do it. Absolutely. We had an alum who uh, one of the grandparents unfortunately passed away due to a delay of ambulance service. Mm -hmm. Now she's working on machine learning and optimizing ambulance dispatch. Yeah. I think that's why we need all walks of life is because they bring the, the understanding and empathy, you said, and also the experience to innovate and create in ways that just one slice of people couldn't possibly cover. Yeah. And you said the right thing. People is at the heart of all this. When AI for All was founded, our slogan was, AI will change the world. Who will change AI? Right. That is the core of this yeah. problem. That's awesome. So what are you most excited about? And I'll, I'll ask it two different ways. So, like, what are you most excited about? from a research perspective right now in AI? And like, what are you most excited about from a social good perspective? Uh, and, and hopefully like can, they actually are not mutually exclusive. Yes, I, I very much uh, <laughs> hope that they're not. <laughs> I, I think from basic research science point of view, there's one direction that I'm exploring with my collaborators at students at Stanford that really excites me. And it goes back to what we were saying about the babies and scientists mm -hmm. in the crib, because early childhood is this rich period of learning the world that is in such fascinating ways. This is where you're not labeling a thousand cat images and showing it to a baby and yeah. say, cat, 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 right? That just doesn't work. They're just exploring out of curiosity and, and all that. So there's a project at Stanford I'm involved in, and I have students working on it. It's curiosity-based learning. is where mm. we design machine learning agents and put them in unfamiliar environment, mm -hmm. and they have capability to interact with the objects mm -hmm. in the environment and watch how the agent through these kind of curiosity based learning develop capabilities mm -hmm. of recognizing objects or understanding physical properties of mm -hmm. objects and is this a variation of reinforcement learning where it uses reinforcement learning it uses definitely deep learning as a early representation of the world deep learning is very useful right. but it's a combination of deep learning reinforcement learning it's curiosity driven, so, so. And how do you articulate the curiosity? So, like, there must be some metric for it, right? Right. Curiosity is expressed through your known model of the world mm -hmm. and the difference you observe. Oh, interesting. And uh, for babies, it's the same, right? If they keep seeing the same thing, they get bored. Mm -hmm. So they want to explore different aspects. So mm -hmm. they want to create new things. So if you give a baby a ball, maybe he or she would first look at the ball and then it'll he or she would drop the ball. If you give him or her two balls, they'll start banging the two balls. So these are the different aspects of, oh, of interacting with the world. So we start seeing that. 
And it's still early research, but what I would love to see is behavioral patterns emerge from the machine learning agent, and then we can do human experiment to mm-hmm. contrast and compare and see if we can improve our machine learning algorithm, but also to see what emerges from machines that are different from humans. And do you imagine in this research that the models will be very large just because you want something that's sort of expansive and has the room to learn different sorts of representations in this space? or So this is where it's very different from the brain. <laughs> we start small. The, mm-hmm. the models, because they simulate the environments, they're okay. pretty simple. So a couple of objects with simple shape and color and material. Mm-hmm. But we want to grow the world, right. the, simu- the, the, the machine agent world. And I'm not going to be surprised if this model becomes larger and larger. Right. Yeah, I mean, the the reason I ask is, like, one of the things that really has started to intrigue me over the past few years is, and, and, like, I think this has sort of been true for, like, the past decade or so, the things that have been making the fastest progress in AI are things that have some sort of connection to one or more things that are growing exponentially fast. Chips. So, like, compute, data. compute and data have been the, yeah. the two big things, you know, that are driving. They're not the sole things They're not driving progress at all, actually. They're facilitating very rapid progress. And so, like, I'm always looking for that connection. On the other hand, a human brain operates on less than 20 watts. Yeah, I know. It's a a brilliantly efficient thing. Exactly. (laughs) It doesn't take that many neurons to get the first impression of the world when you open your eyes. So, So there are some really interesting contrasts in biological intelligence and machine intelligence. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm probably getting the details on this wrong, but I remember, like even a couple of years ago, reading uh, reading a like a little short note in Science or Nature about how someone had used uh, fMRI to map out the primate uh, neural network, like biological neural network that does face recognition, mm-hmm. and it was like tiny, like a little mm. little bitty network. It's uh, called uh, yeah, the central area is called FFA. In fact, that was. In 1990s, late 1990s, the MIT researcher Nancy Kemmerer and many of her colleagues were at the forefront of that study mm-hmm. and really give rise to a lot of neural correlate belief that there are areas of brain with those kind of expertise. Yep. And they're not that huge. Yeah, and so before we get on to the social stuff, which I'm super interested in, like, tell me a little bit more about this work that you're doing that sort of blends vision and language together, because that, that seems really quite exciting. Yeah, so it actually is a continuation or a step forward from ImageNet. If you look at what ImageNet is, for every picture, we give one label of an object, Fine, that's cool. You have 50 million of them. It becomes a large data set to drive object recognition. But it's such an impoverished representation right. of the visual world. Yes. So the next step forward is obviously to look at multiple objects and you know be able to recognize more. But what's even more fascinating to me is not the list of 10 or 20 objects in a scene. It's really the story. Mm -hmm. And so right after the bunch of work we have done with ImageNet around 2014, when deep learning was, you know, showing its power, my students and I started to work on what we call image storytelling or captioning. Mm -hmm. And we show you a picture, you say that two people are sitting in a room having a conversation. That's the storytelling, and that is a sentence or two, right? right? And honestly, I'll tell you, Kevin, when I was in grad school in early 2000, I thought I wouldn't see that happening in my lifetime mm-hmm. because it's such an unbelievable capability right. humans have to connect visual intelligence with language, right. with that. But uh, in early 2015, my group and my students and I um, published the first work that shows computers having the capability of seeing a picture and generate a sentence that describe the right. scene. And that's the storytelling uh, work. And we used, obviously, a lot of deep learning algorithm, especially on the language side, we use recurrent models like LSTM mm-hmm. to yep. train the language model, whereas on the 
image side, we use convolutional neural network representation. Right. But stitching those together as seeing the effect was really quite a wowy moment. Right. I could not believe that I saw that in, in my lifetime, that capability. Yeah. I sort of wonder like whether or not these big unsupervised language models right now, these uh, transformer things uh, that people are building, the models that come out of them like have such – like they, they're just very large and like there's not much uh, – you sort of barely have like any signal in the parameters at all. It's like just diffuse across the uh, entire model. I just wonder like whether getting – like a vision model coordinated with training these things uh, is going to be the way that, like, they more concisely learn. Oh, I see. Well, yeah, I mean, mm. human intelligence is very multimodal. So multimodality yeah. is definitely not only complementary, but sometimes it's more efficient, yeah. right? So we should also just recognize that, by and large, these storytelling models are still fitting patterns. Mm -hmm. They lack yeah. the kind of comprehension and abstraction and deep understanding that humans have. They can say two people are sitting in a room having a conversation, but they lack the common sense knowledge of the social interactions right. or, 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 you know, why are we having eye contact or whatever, right. right? So there is a lot more deeper things going on that we don't know how to do yet. And so on the social side, like, what are you excited about? And obviously, like, you've already talked about a ton of it. Like, you're doing this really interesting work in healthcare, HAI. Like, I think both in and of itself and as, you know, just sort of an example and role model for the, like, wider academic world is, like, a fantastically good thing and sort of calling out that, like, this has to be, you know, inclusive and multidisciplinary. But, like, what are you hopeful about in the future? Oh, God, so many things, right? Even on the healthcare side, we just touched the aging population. But what I really feel so passionate about is my collaborator, Dr. Arnie Milstein, and I really see that while there's a lot of talks about AI in healthcare, much of that is in the diagnosis and genomic side, but there's a huge open issue in the care delivery side. Mm -hmm. In fact, in America, that medical error-induced uh, fatality is causing a quarter of a million lives right. every year, right? Hospital-acquired infection alone kills three times more people than car accidents. And you mentioned smart sensors. The same technology we're using for self-driving cars between smart sensors and deep learning algorithms can become so critical and helpful in improving care quality from our surgical rooms to ICUs to senior homes. And so we are passionate about continue working that space and to change healthcare delivery quality. Yeah. In addition to that, both by working Stanford's HAI and AI for All, what I really want to do is to create this platform. I cannot possibly do all the work. I don't possibly have all the good ideas. But creating the platform to welcome the kind of talented people, thinkers, students, and leaders, practitioners, policymakers, civic society, to participate in this uh, effort and movement, I think will be critical for our future. You know, we talk about how to predict our future. Well, the best way to predict is to create. Yeah. Oh, God, I could not agree yeah. more. And like showing everyone that, you know, there are far more hopeful paths than there are yes. sort of pessimistic ones, like gives everyone both inspiration and permission to go off and like create that more hopeful future. Yeah. And I particularly want to encourage and inspire people. You do not have to be a coder to join no. AI and to change AI. I think that myth from Silicon Valley that you have to be a, you know, a coder from 11-year-old and, and yeah. no TensorFlow or, or whatever inside out in order to be part of this AI movement. Yeah. That's absolutely not true. We need artists. We need writers. We need social scientists. We need philosophers. I totally agree. We need more people involved in more ways with this technology than we ever have yeah. in the, like, sort of lifetime of digital technologies. And, like, I would even argue that... AI itself is making the task of developing things, like the engineering task, 
different and more inclusive. Uh, yes. It, like, you and I, you know, got into you know, sort of computer science because, like, you know, we have a certain sort of analytical way of seeing the world. And, like, we really enjoy, like, all of the apparatus of that right. analytical world. but. You know, there are these machine teaching systems where, like, you're going to be able to, you know, sort of rather than tell the computer what to do in these, like, minute, you know, step-by-step algorithmic ways, uh, you're going to be able to teach a computer how to do something. Exactly. And, like, that is a really, like, much broader mode of, uh, you know, sort of building these bits of technology. I can't tell you how many artists have reached out to me and to stand for HAI about AI helping the creative process. They're so excited. Yeah, it's super exciting. One of my, um, that, you know, I hope to be able to get them on the podcast at some point, but uh, there's this fantastically talented young jazz musician named Jacob Collier, mm. who he's like a genius with harmonic theory. And he does like all of these like super interesting, innovative arrangements. And uh, like he got famous by recording these layered things that he was making on YouTube, but he like really enjoys performing these things live. And so he's been collaborating with this uh, with this really uh, talented engineer at MIT to build instruments where he can reproduce some of this self-harmonization oh, stuff. So cool. And like AI is going to do nothing but help him right, like right, be able right. to like deliver these richer experiences to his audience. I mean, it's Absolutely. just, it's, it's amazing. Like, I'm, yeah. this, this is stuff that makes me really, uh, really super excited. <laughs> so, like, one last question before we wrap up. So, I know your mom, and you've got a nonprofit, you're an institute director, you're, you're a professor. Yeah, researcher. You know, like, you were just telling me you've got, like, this stack of uh, submissions that are going into... In the 24 neural infant- hours. Yeah, and so, like, thank you, by the way, for uh, doing the podcast when no you got problem. this big deadline. But, you know, aside from these things, like, what do you do for fun? Like, what's- <laughs> You know what? My students asked me the same question a month ago, <laughs> and they even laughed. They don't think I could have a good answer, and I don't know if I could have a good answer. So what do you define fun? The bless for myself is that my work is fun to me. Yeah. Hanging out with my kids is fun for me. I mean, granted, if they throw a tantrum, it's not a fun moment. But I love being with my kids. I love my students, talking to them on research ideas. Even if we come up with a bunch of stupid ideas, that process is fun. HAI is so much fun meeting. You know, we have 200-plus faculty across the campus working on different aspects. Just talking to any one of them is fun. So from that point of view, I mean, I do miss some of the early pre-kids two-people world where my husband and I would go for movies or right, or, right. or travel to a foreign country. I haven't had that for a while. Yeah. That I, I mean, I travel, but not for a vacation. But I love reading. Yeah. I always read a lot of different books. I love food. Mm-hmm. Good food is always fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so when I was a kid, I actually do painting. One day I'll pick that up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I I think you're right. Like, what do you do for fun? Uh, I I've I pray for more time because I <laughs> <laughs> podcasting is fun. <laughs> this is uh, it's really just a great thing to be able to enjoy the work that you're doing to yes. sort of combine the things that you're most interested yeah. in with the things that you know are somehow creating some sort of positive benefit for other people. Yeah. Um, like and so like that, that for me is fun. Right, exactly. Like in one month, Stanford is going to welcome our 2019 class of AI for all students. I'm just so looking forward to that, right? Like I'll be getting to know another yeah. group of 32 unbelievable high schoolers. Yeah. And that's fun. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my fun, like if I had to boil it down into two things, it is uh, being able to do something that – fulfills my curiosity mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, and to be able to make things, you know, aside from like my number one fun thing is being with my kids. But, you know, like if I'm just sort of looking selfishly at my at myself, it's like the, you know, the sort of the curiosity in making. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Being well, a professor is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Which is great to hear because uh, like I contemplated being a professor for a long it's while. Not, and it's I never looked too at it late. And, uh, <laughs> no, I think it might be too late for me, Fei <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if you don't try, how do you know? <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, and thank and you, more importantly, like thank you for like all of the great work that you're doing now, trying and to make good luck AI more to humane. your book. I look forward to that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed Kevin's interview with Fei-Fei Li, researcher and professor at Stanford University. So what I thought was really interesting about this conversation, Kevin, was she described her convoluted, in her words, entry point to computer science and that her passion for physics was kind of what led her into this. But this is something that we've kind of seen with other guests on the show where people have an untraditional way of getting into into these subjects. Yeah, and it's it's really amazing, like a bunch of— different people find their way to AI from a bunch of different paths, although the physics one is not that uncommon. I was going to say, that's the one we've kind of heard again and again, is that there's something to that, I guess. I've, I've, I've been thinking for a bit about this idea that maybe artificial intelligence uh, for human intelligence is sort of the same thing as physics is for the natural world. So, like, when you think about physics, it's the way that a curious person can approach, like, all of these super complicated phenomena that occur in the natural world. And so, like, you can describe them and, like, build these models of them and understand them and be able to predict them. Um, And human intelligence is this super-duper complicated thing. I'm I'm sure that one of the first thoughts that human beings had as soon as we were self-aware and had language was like, what is this thing? Like, you know, why do I have the thoughts that I have? Like, what is, uh, what's the nature of my own, own intelligence? And so, we've been thinking about it philosophically for thousands and thousands of years, uh, just sort of the the nature of human intelligence. And we've been thinking about it scientifically for several hundred years now with increasingly better, you know, sort of biology and neuroscience. But still, the phenomenon are so complicated uh, that... You know, one of the things that may be very interesting about AI is that uh, it could be a system that shines light on how human intelligence actually works by giving us a way to model it in some, uh, you know, analytical system. Yeah, no, and that's really interesting, too. I think when you look at the role that physics obviously plays with things like quantum and how that could then also go into looking at those models and furthering AI yep. and whatnot. And that, that kind of leads me to another thing that uh, Fefe was talking about, and, and you were as well, but this concept of, of human-centered AI and the idea that AI isn't only computer science, that it's interdisciplinary. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think we can see that more and more all the time. I mean, it's very obvious to me, at least, that if you are building a technology that's going to have such a massive potential impact on the world that you want everyone to be thinking uh, as hard as they possibly can about how to make sure that it is sort of providing some set of human-centered benefits that are equitably distributed and uh, sort of fair, Uh, like all of the things that we just sort of want for society itself, like we should embed into into AI and guide its development accordingly. Um, And I think that's not just a, I mean, it's obviously not a computer science only thing. It has to be about philosophers and ethicists and economists and business folks and historians and writers and artists. And so, like, we really, really have to make all of this a multidisciplinary effort if we want to get a thing that is truly a reflection of our own humanity. One of the things that I really liked about your discussion is that oftentimes you and I, when we kind of have talk, when we talk about AI, it's about, like, the downsides or, or the potential challenges and, and, and maybe the scary aspects. And in this case, really, the idea of AI, you know, augmenting or enhancing and and helping rather than replacing how things work uh, in in the world. How can we use this to make things better rather than how is this a threat? Yeah, and and this is the thing that I tell people all the time. AI is just another tool that we human beings have invented to do things. uh, And, like, we get to choose what we have the tool do. And... 
like when we make choices about, uh, say, for instance, applying AI to healthcare to make things less expensive and more accessible and higher quality for everyone, like it obviously creates this uh, amazing positive human benefit. Uh, and so, like, I think the trick to getting, you know, the balance of AI to be uh, beneficial and good for everyone is us choosing to do that. Uh, and so it's like really, really amazing to have a computer scientist and one of the pioneers of the field uh, like Fei-Fei spending so much of her energy thinking about what those beneficial uh, beneficial applications of AI are. No, I, I totally agree. It definitely makes me feel better, I guess, about like the future, both of like humanity and um, you know the world we live in with all of this stuff. Yeah, I, I, I have faith in us. Great. Okay, so we are out of time for now, but if you haven't listened to all of our past podcasts, you might want to spend a few minutes catching up. Now, Kevin, do you have a favorite past episode? Uh, uh, I love them all equally, like my children. <laughs> my children are... Uh... Are like my is like my media collection, yeah. so I, I I know how you feel. Okay, but our listeners will have to make the decision for themselves. Um, but you can also write to us anytime at behind the tech at microsoft.com and tell us what's your favorite show and maybe what you'd like to hear more about. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.